Hello. So I would like to try to demonstrate to you the use of powder diffraction or also called wide angle X-ray scattering uh, data analysis tool in IRENA. So um, this tool is in SAS here in powder diffraction fitting equals wax wide angle scattering. So first, what data you need for that? In this case, you need a powder diffraction data. In our case, we collect the data on an area detector based uh, powder diffractometer as a part of our USAX instrument. And what I have here is a graph of aluminum and dioxide, alpha alumina also known as corundum which we have annealed at different temperatures. You can see I have a sequence of measurements starting at 30 degrees going to 1350 and then back to 40. What I'd like to do is analyze the position of selected peaks uh, as a function of temperature, for example. So this is using IRENA plotting tool. So you have a plotting tool and uh, we're using a QRS naming system. I'll demonstrate a little bit later what it is. But anyway, what I have is I have a main graph, uh, main graph here and a window in which I have stuck these things. If you go in and zoom on a specific peak, you will find out that different colors will show you that it basically goes from whatever the despacing is out here and as we heat it up the thermal expansion causes this peak to shift down and then of course as we cool down back again it comes back up so you basically start at 40 or 30 or 40 degrees you can see first and last one overlap and they're basically going up and down so what we'd like to do is somehow analyze this get a numbers as for the peak positions as a function of this uh, temperature for example so let me kill that for now and demonstrate what you need as a data in in our case we have generated the data using nika package uh, so our measurements have uh, shown it uh, have, have generated uh, have generated a area detector based images we then ran a nika uh, with the proper calibration and we got a what is called QRS data. So in here we have in Igor we have now a folder called WAX, wide angle X-ray scattering, inside which each measurement at any temperature has a folder. The folder has a name which contains now temperature and an order number. The underbar C means a circular average. And then we have a what's called QRS naming system. So in here, the Q is a scattering vector. Down here, you can see how the Q changes as a function of point on that. So it's a one column of data. R is an intensity. S in uncertainty, you can ignore the other ones. W is basically the Q resolution. Anyway, so each one of these has one, one folder. That is what is called QRS naming system in IRENA. So now if I want to analyze these positions, I'm going to go in and I am going to pick the powder diffraction fitting wide angle scattering. When you do it, you can then up, get a panel. In the panel itself, you select what type of data you have. The most likely one is the QRS. You select where the data are. And then what we need to do is select a sorting order how are the data sorted because in this case we would like to start at one temperature probably the low temperature and then fit either all of them as a function of temperature which would be here if we go alphabetically you can see get 30 degrees but that's a first measurement then get a 40 degrees but that's actually the last one of the last measurements 106 107 are the last measurements so in this case they are ordered according to the increasing temperature here that may not necessarily be the best thing because if you would like to plot at the end the results as a function of of temperature or expo exposure sequence you would like to order these and process these in the appropriate order so and there's a lots of different methods how to sort samples out in which in this case if you look on that we have a name under bar something with a c so we can order on something which has a C in it, which is degrees in centigrade. We have an underbar and we have the order number, which is the sequence number as we collected the data. Then we have underbar and the C basically tells us that it's a circular average in Nika. Turns out that if you go in here, you have a something which is going to order according to the second sequence from the end. So if we do it, it actually orders according to this number. So it's ordered 83 first, 80, 85 later, and so on. So this is the sequence of in which we were all collecting the data. 
So now we have the data in and ordered in such a way. Let's pick the first one. If you double click on it, it automatically creates the graph. So here's a graph of alpha alumina, which we collected. Um, you may want to try to uh, identify the diffraction lines and the typical way to do that is put this stick graph over it with the JCPD as powder diffraction profiles. And Nika can, uh, Irina can do that. Here in diffraction lines you can actually put in uh, some JCPDS cards. Now the Irina will not connect to JCPDS server and it costs a lot of money for that server to actually have access to. So uh, if you have access to it good, if not I have actually included some cards. So if you click here I have calculated some uh, cards uh, out of based using of uh, models. So there are tools which allow you to calculate powder diffraction profile based on a crystal structure. So for example that's a sapphire hexagonal. When you copy it in it becomes a, a available to you inside, uh, inside this given Igor experiment. I can uh, select uh, this one and if you close it they're now available here you can now check the checkbox and you will see the bars added in them if you right click on here you can select a different color like this one and then you have it in blue if you have HKL tags with it you can click on HKL tags and will provide you with HKL tags uh, what you can see is there are some peaks which are obviously missing uh, like this one here is clearly missing uh, so this may not be the best one. If you have access to a JCPDS database on an, an, another computer or on this computer, you can actually export the JCPDS PDF4 cards as an XML. And I have done some of that, so I have a folder with them here. Uh, the output file is JPEG, which is just an image of the powder profile, so that's not very helpful, but there's an XML card which you can use. And then you can do an load it in Igor. When you have it in Igor it creates a table and then you can uh, you can use the table here you can edit the table if you want uh, but you can add the PDF card here and you can see that's much better than it was before it basically matches all the peaks we have up to here and it's probably missing in the card. Uh, you can also add tags to it and it's gonna get you the tags to it. So now you have a possibility to identify and you can import more and then put them over it as you need it. So that allows you to identify which peaks is which and, and which one you should analyze. So <clears throat> the next step is you may want identif to identify how this peak changes as a function of your processing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select just three peaks here and I'm going to go to peak fit. I'm going to start multi-peak fitting and when I do that I can then go in and say auto locate peaks. It will find the best possible locations for peaks. If he doesn't find them correctly, let's say that I would go here and I would say auto locate. Notice it misses these small peaks. You can then go in, uh, select an area with marquee. You can click in here. Let's, let's do it this way. Let's say you go in here and you want to add this peak here. So let's go in here, add or edit peaks, and then you can go in here and you can simply draw a peak in the area where you think it needs to be. And by moving a little bit around, you can get a peak in and it adds a peak in here. Notice the peaks can have constraints and can have parameters. So if you look in here, there are peak locations. These are the guesses. If you apply constraints, you can actually add minimum and maximum. And not only that, you can set it and then copy that value to P all peaks of this type. So it is possible because it's a least square fitting. If the least square fitting is keeps losing positions and going to never never land, uh, you can go and start constraining the fits so they will not disappear too far. Anyway, so let's just go in and select these first three peaks. So we get a peak one, two, and three. And if we have that, we can now go in and say do MPF fitting and it will try to fit that. The primary assumption of the baseline is a constant. Uh, you can pick from some other ones. I have a polynomial up to 10th power. Um, you can do a few other ones. Uh, probably uh, I can do the poly and, and try how does it fit. And it fits better, of course, because it can now fit this, this, this peak shape out here. But for the purpose of what we are doing is we'll just good a linear fit. 
and let's just do a fit. Uh, it's not going to be as good, but it's going to be okay. Now, you can now go in and you can say record the result. If you do a record result, it will generate two notebooks for you. This one is a kind of human readable result uh, notebook. It's going to go in and tell you what is it you have done, what gives you what the baseline is, it gives you parameters of the peak, and so you can out of this you can kind of humanly read it. This one generates basically the same results, but you get them as a table. So then you have a type of the peak for 1, 2, and 3, or 0, 1, and 2, actually, that's the Igor numbering. And then you have location, location uncertainty, amplitude, amplitude uncertainty, and so on. So this is kind of good, but it's not very helpful if you have a lots of data sets. So here is how you can process a lots of data sets. <clears throat> Basically, you can let the tool do a sequence of these. So let me select all of them. Let's see if that works. Uh, or maybe let's start with few. Just let's start with few of them. And then out here, <coughs> you can give it a folder name. So let's uh, call it a three peaks. Okay. If you do this, it will do a sequence of these and it will store the results, these results and more, <coughs> in a folder root wax fit results three peaks. So you can do it, for example, fit <coughs> on one peak at a time and have them stored in different folders. That helps to analyze the data. <coughs> when you're happy about everything ready to go, you can do a fit and record the range of data. What it will do is it will stick in the data and it will fit the results. And as it fits the results, it's going to go through the samples. You can see here at the top, it's changing the sample order. So now we are now on sample 89, which is the last one. So let's go and take the rest of them in and just fit the rest of them. And you can see it's 90, 91. <coughs> And so what it's doing, it's, it's swapping the data set for the tool. So the tool actually doesn't necessarily know the data have changed. It just replaces the data set inside. It pushes the fit button and then it records all of these numbers. And it records them in that folder which you provided here. And so eventually we can then look through them and generate graphs and do other work with it, which is what we'll do next once we get through as we are on 103, 104, 105 going to be next, <coughs> 106, and now we have 107. Okay, so we're done. You can see that at some point the fitting went haywire and it has generated a wrong fit. So obviously somewhere we lost the least square fitting. Least square fitting is famous for losing... <coughs> for losing uh, itself and going to a absolutely physically meaningless numbers, what you would have to do is go back <coughs> and probably start putting in things like uh, constraints. So you would go in here and you would go and set, for example, that the width has to be larger than uh, than uh, than zero or larger than something and height has to be larger than zero and so on. So uh, we probably would have to deal with that a little bit better. Uh, I just for the purpose of demonstration, I'm not going to do it, but it is possible to then go back and, and tweak the parameters here in such a way that it will not be able to go to Never Never Land. So now if you want to find what you got, you go to plot evaluate the results. First thing is let me show you where the results are. So in here now, <coughs> in three peaks, for each one of your data sets is created a new folder in which you have a peak one, uh, peak zero parameters, peak one parameters, peak two parameters, and there's lots of other things including fit to data. So you can go back and investigate and, and use these results to actually do something. So <coughs> I'm going to pick the three peaks, I'm going to pick peak zero, and you can graph above selected peak, and if you do it, here is the fits to your peak. Okay, so this is, this is a peak fit this is the fitted data to it. And then if you do graph selected parameters, here is, for example, a table. Here is an area of the peak. Here is the width of the peak. And here is a position in degrees. Only the last one went haywire. 
if you look on that here is how the position changes as a measurement so this would be an angle as a function of measurement and so early on we were going a little bit faster in temperature so that's 30 200 that's a 200 nearly 200 degree steps 200 degree steps another another and then we went in 50 degree steps here and then going back out we went in i think 100 degree steps okay so you can see how the d spacings this is actually the theta angle so it's related to the d spacing how it changes as a function of the order number here and all of these numbers there's a table with them here there's a graph and all of these are available to you here so if you look through some of these uh, some of these uh, waves you you open them up you will find all of these results in here so it is possible then go to back and use these for your own purpose where you can convert them in some other units you can work with them you can generate for them for example a temperature uh, wave so you can have a wave which contains the temperatures at which they were measured and plot them as a function of temperature there's a lots of things which you can do with them now because they are now your uh, your useful parameters uh, and they are in waves so you can actually get to them very easily uh, you can do the same thing of course for peak one when you do it here is your peak one you can see except for the large last one which went haywire all the other ones look perfectly fine and then you can do the same thing and that's not interesting i don't think that's interesting but this is the same thing so if you go through it you will find out that that's your angle comes down comes back down and then comes back up so this is a quick and easy way how to generate first thing is pull out the right data and generate some useful tables out of it instead of having to go back in all of these this is so these are your records and you can go back and of course read them manually from here if you want to you can plot the print them on a piece of paper or you can do whatever you want with them they are available it's a text document um, here is another text document it's even worse to read but it's all in here so you can go in and you can try to figure it out these ones are actually opened individually for each one of your measurements and but then you have these graphs which are useful and then you have uh, then you have the results which are here and so you can actually generate when you select this peak 2 and then you say graph that just generates the graph but when you click on this button it has to generate the numbers for this table so this table are these waves so it's from here to here okay this table which is where you have your angle width and height is actually these waves so if you want these you can then work with these somewhere else you can manually change them you can use them for your own uh, further steps in processing because this is reliably not the last thing you wanted to do with the data anyway so this is just about it this is a tool which therefore allows you to go in and using diffraction lines to identify the uh, the spacings uh, the phases which you have uh, you can you know append tags and then you can work with this graph and you can uh, put this graph in uh, in uh, in a paper for example if you need to with the tags pointing to the right uh, right peaks uh, so that's one thing that you can do with that and then you can do a peak fit and you can fit the peaks and you can get the despacings individually there are a few other things in here which all are described if you hit this display help you actually get two different types of help number one which you get is the there is an there's a help file i probably won't generate too many of these because it's a giant nightmare to generate these uh, but um, but that's a help file igor help file that's available even when you are offline uh, and it describes what i just was talking about if you are online it will also open the current read the doc manual for Irina and that is here it opens up and shows you and basically walks you through everything I have done so everything hopefully should be um, reasonably clear and, and obvious for you 
Okay, so let me hide that. Last few things in here. If in, in our case, what we do is we subtract background measurements. So we basically do exactly the same processing for wax as we do for sex and USEX. We measure an instrumental curve. We measure a, a measurement. We expose the uh, detector without the sample. We actually measure transmission of a sample in in during the measurement during the wide angle scattering measurement and we use those uh, to normalize and correct in case that you wouldn't be doing that you can actually include that here so if your data were processed without background subtraction but you have measured background you can actually use that and stick in one of the samples as a background that's sometimes useful because you might be measuring a sample as it changes and something new grows in there and if the other material doesn't change too much or doesn't change at all you can actually subtract the starting material as a background from your measured data later down the road and that way you will isolate only the new faces so it allows you to see weaker scattering once in a while anyway um, so that should be just about all there is a display uncertainties here which adds error bars so you can see how precisely you know the data but that's relatively rarely really useful so this is all there is about this tool as far as I can say this should get you running and get you provide uh, the basic uh, use of this tool so if you have any questions uh, read the manual and if you run into any bugs or any other problems, please uh, send me instructions how to recreate the problem so I can fix the bugs and we can all have a better software. Okay, well, thank you very much.